Hi, everyone, and welcome to August edition of the Reading Research Recap. As a parent or a teacher, you might be wondering how many minutes a day should your students or children be reading? As a parent myself, this is a nightly battle. Thankfully, we have this brand new research paper to offer us some guidance. Let's dive right in. The researchers estimated the number of words learned by building a model that took into account things like challenge level, time spent reading, and the probability of learning a word after each encounter with that word. Their analysis found that a sixth grader needs to be reading half a million new words a year to be able to learn 2,000 new words incidentally. Now this translates into the magic number of 17 minutes a day of reading for school days. Now that goes down to eight minutes a day if it's every day and not just school days. Now this paper didn't touch on just how many minutes or time spent reading. It also talks about what you should be reading and how you should be reading. In terms of what to read, children should be provided text where they know 95% of the words or more or else their comprehension will suffer. The paper specifically calls out Lexiles as a good metric to use. In terms of how to read or which instructional supports you should use, this paper focused on incidental learning. That said, the researchers do mention that explicit direct instruction in vocabulary and or morphology could have multiplicative effects on new word learning and comprehension. All right, up next, I have some highlights from SSSR, which is a really famous and prominent reading research conference. This year, it was held in Calgary, Canada. Hi, everyone. I made it to Calgary, Canada, and I'm here at SSSR. Started the first day, the morning session, with just an amazing symposium by five early to mid-career female neuroscientists talking about individual differences in the brain and what this has to do for word reading development and education. Dr. Rebecca Mark showed that there's differences within the reading brain networks that emerge within the first few months of school. Dr. Jin Wong showed that regions in the brain for phonological and orthographic representations are interactive and work together, lending support for this notion that we should be combining sounds and print when we are doing interventions or training. Dr. Rachel Eggleston showed that morphological training might be especially useful for students who struggle with dyslexia as it acts as a binding agent between print, meaning, and phonology. Dr. Ola ozernov palchuk investigated this mysterious overactivation seen in poor readers and students with dyslexia. She hypothesizes that it might be involved, so the right IFG might be involved in text-specific contextual integration. And lastly, Dr. Tahila Nubiel found that the connectivity of cognitive control regions predicted the reading skills of English language learners, thus having implications for the design of executive function, trainings, or interventions. There were also some really great posters during the poster session on the first day. Here were two of my favorites. This team of researchers found that understanding a new screener is so important for the adoption, so the use of it, but also in trusting it, which is why they are embarking on a lot of PD around it in terms of explaining it. And this is really cool because this poster and this research is in relation to a new screener in Virginia called Vowels, which my son just took this past year. Another great poster was presented by Dr. Marion Rice about this idea that effect sizes and thresholds should be determined perhaps by the outcome measure, whether you're trying to improve phonemic awareness, word learning, etc. She found that these effect size thresholds worked for phonemic awareness. After the poster session, there were several more wonderful talks, and here's some highlights from those. Dr. Julia Yee's work showed that decoding interventions for adolescents are definitely effective, but we don't know yet which of these specific intervention approaches is most effective. There was also this fascinating talk about social robots and language learning in the classroom, but no surprise here, they're just not ready yet. Dr. Jake Downs had a fascinating talk showing that results on a cadence student measures favored 95% group versus an old curriculum reading mastery, but teachers and students weren't randomized to conditions. This was a natural experiment, so you have to keep that in mind. 
SSSR has sometimes been critiqued as being too researchy, too esoteric, and not linked directly to the practicalities of being a classroom teacher. And while there are certainly valid reasons for why that may be, I've seen a trend over the last few years, and especially this year, in including more school change, more presentations, talks, and posters about school change and professional development of teachers, including wonderful talks by the team at Literacy IO about that topic, and this one by Margaret Goldberg and her principal, Jamie, about how they transform the literacy scores in their school. SSSR was such an amazing conference, super thought-provoking, and I learned so much. Now, I do want to apologize if I wasn't able to attend your talk or poster. As a research nerd, it's painful to not be able to go to every single presentation and share that information with all of you. I do also want to say a special thank you, though, to the pre-conference organizers. It was humbling to be asked to be part of this amazing group of people, this panel, talking about alternate career pathways if you don't want to become a researcher or a professor and stay in academia. I hope our advice was helpful to the next generation of graduate students. All right, that's all that I have for August, and I'll see everyone in September.